Hello and welcome to Friday Night Games. I'm your host, Jay Comics. And look, I already know what you're thinking. One Jay Comics? Why only one Jay Comics? Clearly, Friday Night Games would be a million times better if there were two Jay Comicses. Jay Comics. Jay Comicses? Two of me! Don't lie, everyone knows two is better than one. Even Nintendo decided to take two screens and smash them together into the multi-screen series, and that turned out awesome! That's it! I'm gonna make a copy of myself. Hey there, good looking. Ah! Oh, you. Are you ready to talk about the Game & Watch multi-screen? You know I am. Especially because everyone knows you talk way too much. Alright then, let's... Wait, what? and you're just so boring and your jokes aren't funny and those cat breaks just go on and on and on. Okay, never mind. One J Comics is plenty. Besides, drawing two J Comics was gonna be a pain anyway. Luckily, adding a second screen to the Game & Watch turned out to be a much better idea. But before we get into all of that, you should check out my prior Game & Watch video so you can get caught up to speed on the series so far. The Multi-Screen Game & Watch. Now this is a great series. I mean, just look at this thing. This was a huge leap forward from the widescreen series. The most obvious change from the widescreen to the multi-screen series is, of course, the additional screen. According to R&D1 developer Takahiro Izushi, two years had passed since Game & Watch Ball went on sale, so we thought we should do something new and were given the task of using two screens. No one knew how to do it. Well, that didn't stop them as R&D1 got to work and somehow figured it out. The first multi-screen Game & Watch released just one month after the widescreen series. One month! That is incredible! The clamshell design, which was inspired by makeup compacts, is also perfect. It keeps the portability of the Game & Watch, but with more bang for your buck. Incredibly, the multi-screen Game & Watch is also responsible for the invention of the D-pad. Yeah, that little plus-shaped button you find on nearly every controller, practically synonymous with video games, was invented by Ichiro Shirai and Gunpei Yokoi for the Game & Watch. Are you convinced that the Game & Watch is cool yet? We've heard about Gunpei Yokoi's notoriously high standards. Well, those held true for the development of the D-pad also, as Yokoi wished to ensure that players could play the game without having to look at the buttons. This led to the team adding little things, like an indent in the center. Of course, the multi-screen ditched the kickstand on the back, but the clock and alarm features are still accounted for. Alright, I can't wait any longer, so let's play some of the best games the Game & Watch has to offer. Starting on a high note, we've got... What the hell am I looking at? What is this? This... This box are freaking sucks! Who would buy this? Ha <laughs> ha! Now there's some box art worthy of our very first multi-screen Game & Watch, Oil Panic. Oil Panic had the pressure of being the game that would either make or break the dual screen concept. No easy task. It's one of my personal favorite Game & Watches and one of the models I own physically. First off, I love the silver nameplate and the white color scheme. Pure and virtuous. Just like Jesus intended. And look at this, each screen has a unique background art which makes it feel even more like a video game than the Flagmans and Vermins of yesteryear. Oil Panic only has two buttons, one to go left and one to go right. You control a worker at a gas station as oil leaks from a pipe on the second floor. You catch the oil in a bucket which can hold up to three drops at a time. If you miss catching one or your bucket overflows, the whole place catches fire. The more you fill your bucket before emptying it, the more points you'll receive. Meanwhile, on the lower level, your boss is running from side to side with a barrel, trying to catch the oil as you empty it. If you miss, the oil falls onto the customers. Oh, calm down, it's just gasoline. Cry me a frickin' river. With the prior series, you would only get three misses in a Game & Watch game. But in Oil Panic, you get three misses per screen, a first for the series. Once you reach three misses on either the top or the bottom screen, you lose your job, and potentially your life. I'm just kidding. But you definitely are fired. I'm pretty sure burning down your workplace three times is grounds for automatic termination. 
I mean, management is allowing an oil leak in the building, but no, yeah, this is my fault. Oil Panic really goes all in on the dual screen concept, requiring you to focus on both of the screens during gameplay. Game A is normal mode and Game B speeds things up. It's time for J Comics' Pro Gamer Strats for Gamers! <laughs> Hey gamers, guess what? I learned if you toss your goose lightly before the boss man gets there, you can still make it in the barrel. You'll have to time it right, but this can get you out if you're in a bit of a pickle. Now get out there and game on, gamers. <laughs> Chance Time also returns in the multi-screen series. You activate Chance Time by reaching 300 points without getting a miss. In Oil Panic Chance Time, you get double points and your boss rends himself in twain, creating a doppelganger and making it easier for you to unload your bucket. R&D1 really set the bar high with their first multi-screen outing. I think they did a fantastic job utilizing both screens, as well as making a game that grabs and holds your attention. 10 out of 10. Fix those damn pipes already. Oh hell yeah, it's time for some donkey- Ow! Fuck my eyes! That orange has pierced my retinas, jeez! Nobody is gonna miss this one on store shelves. That's right baby, just one year after the arcade game, Donkey Kong goes portable. This is seriously such a cool game and watch. Nowadays we have the Nintendo Switch which allows you to take AAA games with you on the go, so it's easy to forget how it used to be. But just remember, only two years before Donkey Kong, Ball was cutting edge technology. Now Nintendo is taking a full arcade game and putting it into your pocket. I mean, sort of anyway. It's obviously a much more stripped down version since they were working with calculator technology on only one level, but look at this shit! This is unmistakably Donkey Kong! And unlike in the arcade version, this one adds background art. I love this, it brings so much life to the game. No longer are we in the dark black void. We're in a sprawling metropolis. As for the gameplay, I mean, it's Donkey Kong. And I don't think I need to remind any of my viewers how good I am at Donkey Kong. Damn it! Ah! Fuck! Shit! Nailed it! Once again, you play as the carpenter Mario trying to rescue a lady who has been kidnapped by Donkey Kong. You use the newly introduced D-pad to climb to the top of the building while dodging barrels, which award you one point each. Once you reach the top, you activate a lever, which causes the crane on the right to swing back and forth. You have to quickly jump onto it and then swing to the left so that Mario can reach the wires that hold Donkey Kong's platform in place. After you repeat this process four times, Donkey Kong falls down and you get 20 points. It may just be one level, but this version has a lot going on in these two screens. It actually took me a while to figure out what exactly I had to do because I didn't realize you had to pull the lever or that the timing on the crane had to be exactly right. I guess I should have read the manual. This is Mario's very first appearance on a handheld system and he looks great! It's strange to see clean-shaven Mario, but it also would have been tough to show his mustache. Also, why is Mario wearing a tie? Mario doesn't wear a tie? Oh. Wait, that's an overall piece. My bad. Game B is once again more difficult as these steel beams become much more frequent, making it difficult to navigate to the top. And in Donkey Kong Chance Time, at 300 points with no misses, you get an extra life and you also get double points until you lose a life. The alarm for Donkey Kong is a mini Donkey Kong who looks suspiciously familiar. Could this be the very first introduction of Donkey Kong Jr. into Mario Universe canon? Donkey Kong Jr. was in development during this time, so R&D1 could have been working with Miyamoto-san to hide an easter egg for the future. Um, no. Actually, the Super Mario Wiki clearly states that Mini Donkey Kong is a completely separate character and at most can be seen as a predecessor to Donkey Kong Jr. So, sorry gamers, but Mini Donkey Kong is not Donkey Kong Jr. confirmed. Anyway, that's Donkey Kong on Game & Watch, truly one of the most iconic and influential games of the entire series. It introduced the D-pad, converted an arcade game into a portable experience, and brought Donkey Kong and Mario to the Game & Watch. This one gets 5 out of 5 mini Donkey Kongs. Donkey Kong was the last Game & Watch to be released before Donkey Kong Jr. began filling arcades. Although only half as successful as its predecessor, Donkey Kong Jr. was still a big hit for Nintendo, giving them more confidence in their own characters as we'll soon begin to see. But before all of that, Nintendo would continue borrowing licensed characters to boost the success of the Game & Watch. Like our old friend Mickey Mouse! In the Game & Watch, Mickey and Donald. I never realized before making this series just how much Nintendo and Disney have worked together, even in the early days. And wow, Mickey and Donald is way better than Mickey Mouse on the widescreen. For one, the whole crew is here this time. You've got Mickey, Donald, and Goofy as our main trio, Minnie Mouse shows up whenever you put out the fire, and Pluto even shows up as the alarm. 
And secondly, this scenario actually feels like a scenario we'd see in a Mickey Mouse cartoon, as opposed to... eggs. You get to control both Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck this time as the crew tries to douse the rampaging fire. Goofy is at the bottom, controlling the water flow, and if Mickey Mouse is not right there telling him what to do, he just chills out, slowing the water way down. Take your goddamn time, Goofy! It's not like we've got innocent civilians burning alive or anything! Mickey also needs to move up and down the ladder when a bulge of water comes through so it doesn't spill out. Meanwhile, Donald Duck is at the top of the building controlling where the water falls down. You control Mickey with the left button and Donald with the right. All around, I think it's a much better experience than Mickey's previous outing on Game & Watch. This one is really fun. 8 out of 10 Keyblades. Now we come to a classic, Greenhouse, releasing just one month after Mickey and Donald. Greenhouse is the first appearance of our boy Stanley the Bugman, the same protagonist that would show up a year later in Donkey Kong 3. In his debut role, Stanley, known here only as The Exterminator. Hmm. Not as badass as Stanley the Bugman, honestly. Oh well, it'll do for now. Stanley must protect his precious greenhouse by spraying hungry spiders and inchworms with his spray gun as they descend upon his plants. The game has you climbing madly up and down this central ladder, spraying everything in sight. Inchworms are killed in one spray, but the spiders require a few, as they'll only get pushed back. However, if you spray the spiders in the face right when they're at the bottom, they only take one hit, and it'll give you more points. In Greenhouse Chance Time, as well as the rest of the multi-screen Chance Times, once you reach 300 points, you'll get double points until you get a miss. Stanley also looks great here. I love his hat, boots, and belt, and his expressions are so lively and fun. R&D1 is really stepping up their game on these character models. And the greenhouse setting is wonderful. I love how much color the plants bring to the game. Also, the alarm in this one is a chonky boy. And what's cool about it is when the alarm goes off, the cat is getting stung by a bee spy from Donkey Kong 3. You can even see it has a little spear and everything. Greenhouse is a great time. I always love when I can revisit Stanley, and the gameplay is simple but fun. Definitely a top-tier Game & Watch. In our next game, Donkey Kong Jr. comes swinging onto the Game & Watch in Donkey Kong 2, which is a direct sequel to the Donkey Kong Game & Watch. Jr. finally joins Mario and Donkey Kong in the Game & Watch line. Wait, no, that's not right. Jr. was already on the Game & Watch by this point. Donkey Kong Jr. for the Game & Watch released only a couple of months after Donkey Kong. That was two games ago! God damn it, the chronology is all messed up! Nintendo fucked up the timeline by starting into the multi-screen series and then, not three games in, decided to start another series. The new widescreen series, creating a branching timeline that runs concurrently. Sure, that's all well and good, but they didn't release another new widescreen game until a year later. Also, the multi-screen lasts for seven years! Meanwhile, Nintendo keeps coming out with new Game & Watch series every year like it's nothing! How is a cartoon man on YouTube supposed to make a chronologically accurate series like this? Why would Nintendo personally attack me like this? Why, Nintendo, why? <laughs> Fine. It's really not that big of a deal, but just know that by this point, Nintendo has multiple series running concurrently. Anyway, back to Donkey Kong 2. This game is awesome! Even though it borrows the same story as Donkey Kong Jr., with Mario returning to his villainous role and kidnapping Donkey Kong while Jr., Donkey Kong's son, comes to his rescue, this game feels like its own separate thing. Sure, the scenery is reminiscent of some of the levels in the arcade game, but to me they still look distinct, with jungle vines wrapping around industrial beams and electrical wires overhead. It kind of feels like the Steam Gardens from Mario Odyssey. The gameplay has also been completely reimagined, with mechanics unique to just this version. You play as Junior, except in this version he isn't wearing his iconic onesie, preferring to go naked. You make your way up vines, electrified wires, and chains in order to collect keys to free Donkey Kong. Mario has become even more masochistic in this game. I mean, look at these chains! Poor Donkey Kong is over here looking like Hannibal Lecter! Christ, Mario, what is wrong with you? For each of the four locks, Junior must collect three keys, and you need to climb all the way back down to the bottom after each one. Because of this extra traversal, Donkey Kong 2 is one of the more difficult multi-screen games. All of our favorite enemies from Donkey Kong Jr. return here too. Snapjaws and Sparks award you a point each time you jump over them, while nitpickers will try attacking you as you climb the chains. Donkey Kong 2 is a great time, and it feels different from the Donkey Kong Jr. arcade game. 
If you like that one, or you're a fan of Donkey Kong, you should definitely give Donkey Kong 2 a go. Okay. Up until now, Nintendo surprisingly hasn't focused on Mario that much. Sure, he was the protagonist of the original Donkey Kong, but after that, Nintendo made him the villain, and that's basically where he's stayed. He was even completely absent from Donkey Kong 3. But that's all about to change with the introduction of our next game and Mario's first self-titled Nintendo game ever, Mario Bros. I'm not talking about Mario Bros, or Mario Bros, or Mario Bros. I'm talking about Mario Bros, which came out four months before the arcade version and is completely different. For this game, R&D1 also introduced a revision to the multi-screen series. In this version, the Game & Watch opens sideways like a book. What you got there, son? A book? It's not a book, Dad. It's the horizontal <coughs> multi-screen Game & Watch from Nintendo. God! Why don't you just stay out of my life already? You're becoming more like your father. I really like this revision. It makes Mario Bros. feel special and marks the occasion of Mario's first solo outing. Well, not quite solo, since Mario Bros. also introduces us to everyone's favorite green boy, Luigi. That's right, Luigi was first introduced to the world on the Game & Watch. Look at him there on the cover! Look at his little butt! Originally, Luigi and Mario were twins. It wasn't until later games that Luigi would distinguish himself. Luigi's inclusion alone makes this game really cool, but the game is also weird as fuck, so I love it even more. Apparently, Mario got sick of Donkey Kong's shit and quit being a carpenter altogether. Instead, Mario and Luigi get a job at a bottling plant. You control both brothers as you load boxes onto a central conveyor belt. The boxes are sent back and forth between the brothers, earning you one point per box moved, until Luigi tosses the full boxes into a truck, which then takes them away. This artwork of Luigi tossing the box has got to be one of my all-time favorites. He looks so goofy and happy, I just love him. After that, the bros get a minuscule break before the boss shows up to yell at them. What a fucking asshole. It's nice to know that Mario and Luigi have experienced the bullshit of working a day job just like the rest of us. Game A takes a while to get going, but Game B is more difficult. It also takes time to get into the mindset of controlling both of the brothers, especially making sure Mario returns to the starting position to catch the first box. But once you get the hang of it, this game is really satisfying. It's a weird but cool part of Mario's history that often gets overlooked, but it's definitely one of my favorite Game & Watches. 11 out of 10? Oh Several months passed after Mario Bros. with no new releases in the multi-screen series, while R&D1 focused on making even more revisions to the Game & Watch. Nintendo would also release Mario Bros. and Donkey Kong 3 to arcades. Meanwhile, in between those two games, Nintendo would release an obscure little console you might have heard of called THE NINTENDO ENTERTAINMENT SYSTEM, known in Japan as the Famicom. Nintendo were incredibly busy setting the foundations of what would become their video game empire, and in the meantime, R&D1 was trying to keep the Game & Watch brand alive and relevant. The next entry into the multi-screen series came three months after Mario Bros. Rain Shower is another horizontal model, this time with a blue theme. To be honest, coming off of Donkey Kong 2 and Mario Bros, I wasn't really expecting much from this game. I was excited to see more Nintendo characters in these games, and Rain Shower is a game about doing laundry. But to my surprise, Rain Shower is great! I really enjoyed myself while playing this one. You control this guy trying to do his clothes amidst a rain shower. Not his brightest idea. He attempts to dodge every single droplet of water that tries to touch his clothes, rather than just waiting for the rain to subside. You move him around to each of the lines and pull on the line to move the clothes out of the way. After a while, the rain dies down and the sun comes out, giving you a brief respite before the storm clouds start billowing again. Game B also adds these assholes. These crows make the game significantly more annoying because they'll pull your clotheslines occasionally, usually into the trajectory of rain, but sometimes just to fuck with you. Give me that, you little piece of shit! I'm trying to do my clothes! Fuck off! Rain shower is a fun, if not occasionally frustrating time. I was thoroughly disproven of my initial assumption that a game about laundry would be super boring. 7 out of 10. Make more laundry-based games, cowards! 
Releasing two months after Rain Shower, Lifeboat has the distinction of being the final horizontal multi-screen game, with all future multi-screen games sticking with a traditional vertical orientation. It's kind of sad that they retired this version after only three games, but it does make those three games feel more special. The first thing that sticks out to me is the bright yellowy orange of the casing. So far, the only other Game & Watch with such a striking coloring has been Donkey Kong- ah! Why is it so vibrant? It definitely stands out amongst the other Game & Watches. Lifeboat is basically an upgrade from Parachute. In Lifeboat, we once again are trying to rescue evacuees trying to flee into shark-infested waters, though this time from a burning cruise ship. Holy crap, that's pretty grim. <laughs> Our job is to capture them in two lifeboats in game A, or just a single lifeboat in game B, and bring them to the sides where they can escape onto land. Each lifeboat can hold up to four evacuees, and the closer they are to the land, the quicker they jump out. Having to check both screens to make sure that you know what's going on makes this game especially engaging, just like the other multi-screen games. I definitely think while Lifeboat is not as simple as Parachute, it's a more engaging experience, and I found myself wanting to play it again and again. Once again, another success for the multi-screen series. I give it 4 out of 5 half-eaten evacuees. Compacto? No. Game Watch. Multi-screen. Cigarette case? No. Game Watch. Multi-screen. Is that a Game & Watch multi-screen? Uh, no. Uh, this is my dildo case. At last, we come to the final multi-screen Game & Watch we're gonna talk about today, Pinball, which was released two months after Lifeboat. And if we're gonna talk about Pinball, then I know just the person to call. Jackie boy, hello, fuck! No! Oh! Do you realize what you just made me do? Oh, hey, Jackie boy. I heard you were doing a segment on pinball. I love pinball. That's right, Bean. But today we're going to be talking about Game & Watch pinball, so you need to be a Game & Watch. Huh? Oh! Shit! Everybody welcome my friend, Josh Dean. Bean! That's me. I like pinball, but I don't really know much about it, to be honest. Why don't you give us a quick rundown about pinball, Bean? Okay, well, here's what I know. Modern pinball machines began more as luck-based games in the 30s. They became so popular, they were even making more money than the film industry at the time. It subsequently became outlawed as gambling in the early 40s, and that lasted all the way until the 70s. For that reason, pinball was associated with rebellion and counterculture. However, bumpers were introduced in the late 40s and pinball was now based more on skill rather than luck. Pinball is so simple. There's only two basic rules to know about pinball. Don't let the ball fall beneath the flippers and shoot the shining lights, and that's it. Each pinball machine has unique differences about them, but at the end of the day, those two rules are all you need to really worry about. Anyone can understand it, and the concept is so versatile. You can make a pinball machine that's scuba diving, or Starship Troopers the movie, or your shitty garage band trying to get famous, or the Arabian Nights, or Ripley's Believe It or Not, or Haunted House, or Casino, or Creature from the Black Lagoon, or Monster Mash, or Skyrim, Skyrim! Skyrim? All pinballs. Wow, I didn't know just how much could be done with pinball, but it seems like a perfect fit for the Game & Watch. Let's see how it compares to the rest. Are you ready, Bean? Oh. I'm ready. I'm gonna start off with Game B. Hard mode. Hell yeah. Shut up. Whatever, fine. I'll just play game A. We we're just starting out. It's just practice, practicing. Okay, so I okay. I get three balls in game A. Pew, whoosh, whoop, pew. 
I'm surprised at how responsive this game is. I remember playing old shitty LCD games like from McDonald's and Tamagotchi SHIT! God dang it! Those games sucked and my Digimon always fucking died! Why? It's cool to be able to play a legitimate Game & Watch though, it's better than I expected. You also have to remember this came out in the 80s when you would have to go all the way to the arcade or bar to play pinball. There weren't many options for a portable version, much less on the go. And this isn't just some hunk of junk either, R&D1 put a lot of quality into it. And look at this little robot guy! Look at this little juggling robot! That is a little juggling robot. The contrasting bright pinks and yellows go very well with the slick black and gold casing. Is very... how do you say? I think Pinball is a great inclusion into the multi-screen series, and it's surprisingly fun to play. With Pinball having such an interesting history, I'm glad it was included into Nintendo's Game & Watch lineup. As a fan of Pinball and video games myself, I think without any other portable Pinball options at the time, this one should not be discounted as a legitimate Pinball experience. And I watch your Game & Watch series, Jackie boy, and I notice in these Game & Watch games, you're always controlling a character like you are Donkey Kong or Bugman Steve or whatever. In this one, you're not controlling any character. You are the character, you're just flipping the flippers, and you don't even know where that ball's gonna go. It's very unique compared to the others. No pinball simulation is ever a replacement for a legitimate physical pinball machine, in my opinion. But this could scratch that pinball itch when you're on the go. I agree. Well, thanks for coming on my show and sharing your love and knowledge of pinball, Bean. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on your show, Jackie boy. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate the chance to be on your show. And with that, we finished off the multi-screen series. This series is definitely one of R&D1's crowning achievements for the Game & Watch. I'm very impressed with how they were able to effectively incorporate a second screen in such a short amount of time, while also making both screens necessary in most of the games. The legacy of the multi-screen would extend far beyond the end of the Game & Watch. I've mentioned before that the clamshell design and shape was used as an inspiration for the design of the Game Boy Advance SP, the DS, and the 3DS systems. The D-pad was also a direct creation of the multi-screen Game & Watch. Luigi was born on the multi-screen line, Mario got his very first self-titled game here, and he, Donkey Kong, Jr., and Stanley all made their first leaps into our pockets here as well. It's astonishing to me just how much influence not just the Game & Watch, but the multi-screen series specifically had on Nintendo and gaming as a whole. Nintendo knew they had a good thing here. It was a huge improvement from the widescreen series, and I really love this design. This is so cool! I'd also like to give another subscriber shoutout. Cuteboy296 is a new subscriber to the channel and he's been leaving awesome comments. He even has his own YouTube channel where he does Let's Play videos like Minecraft. Thanks Cuteboy296, you're awesome. Next time we'll be taking a small sidestep to talk about the start of the Game & Watch new widescreen series. What makes it different from the original widescreen series? You'll just have to subscribe so you can tune in next time and find out, right here on Friday Night Games. <laughs>